I think we'll get started. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Ann Smiley, and I'm chairing today's panel. I am the Associate Director of Research and Evaluation at FHI 360, based in Washington, D.C., actually at home right now in Maryland, just outside of D.C., and I also co-lead the INEE Data and Evidence Collaborative together with my colleague Patrick Monteridis of NORAG. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, uh, especially knowing that these are really difficult times and challenging times for everyone for a number of different reasons. And I hope everyone is staying safe and well in your various locations around the world. I want to get us started with a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you can all see the slide in front of you. So due to the high number of participants in this webinar, we're muting all audio and video is disabled for participants. So only the presenters will be able to speak and show their video. You can post questions in the uh, chat box in the Q&A, or is it a yeah, Q&A function actually, separate from the chat box at any time. You can also write in the chat box anything you want to write. Uh, this session is being recorded, and I believe the recording has already started. And um, closed captioning is available in English. Um, if you don't automatically see the English captions at the bottom of your Zoom window, you can click the CC closed caption button to turn it off or on. Um, just want to let you know that to the extent possible, the presenters are planning to respond to your questions uh, in the Q&A and chat boxes throughout the webinar. Um, and then we will have time at the end to hopefully um, uh, discuss some of the Q&A that did not get answered or, or continue to discuss the ones that did get answered in the chat box. All right, so with that, we will go ahead and I'm really excited to introduce today's virtual CIES panel, which is titled Strengthening the Global Education and Emergencies Data Architecture. I wanna let you know that this is the first in a series of three virtual CIES data webinars that were meant to be held in Miami back in March that are being hosted by INEE, obviously a couple months after the original date. Uh, this series um, are going to share those CIES panels that were originally meant to be um, produced in Miami or shared in Miami, and they have been adapted, of course, to this virtual webinar format. So this is the first webinar on the global EIE data architecture. The second webinar takes place a week from today, next week, so put that on your calendars, June 17th at, I think, the same time, and it's titled Using Data to Plan for Crises. And the third webinar, I don't know if we have the time yet, but it's been scheduled for July 2nd. And it's titled Adapting Education Data Systems and Measurement to Emergency and Protracted Crisis Settings. Now, on to today's webinar. So exactly a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, uh, in June of 2019, INEE came together with some other partners, including NORAG and USAID's MIRS project, to host an EIE data summit in Geneva. Today's panel was really organized as a follow-up to that data summit. And we want to provide updates to the global education emergencies community on some of the activities that have taken place in the past year um, related to improving the global EIE data architecture. So during today's webinar, we have individuals representing INEE, the OSHA Center for Humanitarian Data, UNHCR, Translators Without Borders, and NORAG to discuss the latest developments in strengthening the global EIE data architecture since the summit and some possible next steps. The presenters will touch on some of the issues related to COVID-19. They'll talk about the latest in education data for refugees, and they'll talk about an analysis of language barriers that exacerbate existing inequalities in emergencies. So before we begin, I'd like to quickly introduce our speakers. Uh, we're going to start with Sebastian Hine, who is a consultant working closely with the INEE Data and Evidence Collaborative that I co-convene. Um, he has previously worked as a researcher for the Global Education Monitoring Report. He's worked with Save the Children and the Overseas Development Institute. Javier Terran is a statistician at UN OSHA's Center for Humanitarian Data. Uh, Javier started his career as a statistician in Statistics Canada before he joined the UN system where he's worked in several offices, including the UN Statistics Division, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and the UN Department of Operational Support. He's based in Geneva. 
Benoit Dansenberg is a senior education officer with UNHCR based in Copenhagen. His responsibilities include data, evidence, and refugee inclusion. Previously, Benoit has designed, implemented, and monitored EIE programs in a number of countries, mainly in Africa. Alice Castillejo is a program advisor with Translators Without Borders leading their education work. She has spent many years in country director roles in development and humanitarian contexts in South Asia and in Africa. Finally, our discussant, Dr. Moira Fall, joined NORAG as executive director in April 2020. She previously worked as deputy director of the Public Private Partnership Center at the University of Geneva, and she was also visiting professor at the Graduate Institute, uh, IHEID, in 2019. She holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and a teaching qualification from the University of Oxford. So this is our esteemed panel, and um, I'm really excited to get a chance to introduce all of them. So as a reminder, you can post questions in the Q&A box at any time, and please keep your mic muted when you're not speaking. That's mainly a reminder to the presenters. Um, presenters, you will each have 15 minutes for your presentation, and I will be keeping time. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand over to our first presenter, Sebastian Hine. Sebastian? Hello, um, nice to see you all here. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Annie. Um, so yeah, um, I guess given the circumstances in all of our countries, I think um, the situation has shown, you know, the importance of timely and meaningful uh, data in, in responding to crises. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk to you about the education, the Education Emergencies Data Summit that was held last year, um, kind of going through the um, main recommendations and findings from that and progress on agreed actions. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly about uh, a project INEE to create an indicator framework for the existing uh, minimum standards because um, they haven't had indicators previously. Um, I'll talk through uh, a collection of resources that we're putting together on um, data and evidence concerning COVID-19 and education. And finally, I'll let you know about the Education Emergencies Data and Evidence Newsletter, um, which is a way for you to keep up to date with uh, all of these various pieces of work. Next slide. Okay, so the Data Summit, yes, was held uh, uh, last year in uh, Geneva, and as Andy mentioned, it was by INEE, NORAG, uh, the USAID's uh, MIRS program hosted at FHI 360 and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And we we're really discussing, it lasted uh, two days, but we we're discussing kind of two things, how we can collect more and better data on education emergencies, but also how we can make accessible existing data. So this is data that's either available but poorly presented you know in, in pdfs which is hard to extract or it's hidden away within organizations and not publicly available but it does exist um, and as you can see these are some of the issues we identified and discussed over the two days so the issue of standardization of indicators came around a lot so if people are reporting on attendance rates are they reporting on the same um, indicator you know are they saying are they measuring whether children attended school uh, last week or once in the last month or are they enrolled and it's not really measuring attendance that kind of thing um, we discussed um, whether uh, data is fit for purpose how good quality it is um, the ethics of collecting data in with vulnerable groups in these kind of situations um, forgotten populations uh, came up quite a lot and I'm not going to list them all because that would be to forget other groups but one group we did discuss in particular is IDPs which are often uh, which we have very little data for. Um, I'm just trying to think, anything to highlight? Yeah, Beyond Access is really focusing on looking at learning outcomes in emergencies, so rather than just collecting information on attendance and enrollment, you know, whether we can capture meaningful um, uh, data on, on learning outcomes and changing those. So those are some of the things we discussed. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. These were the main recommendations. And at the bottom, you can see the link to uh, the blog, which has links to the action agenda in minutes. And you, there you can find all the detail on the, um, 
issues I, I raised on the on the previous page. But some of the key recommendations was this need for standardized indicators and methodologies, um, a need for guidance on ethics of collection, storage, sharing, and use of EIE data. So this recognizes that you know there is good guidance on ethics of uh, data in humanitarian in the humanitarian sector broadly. Um, on education broadly, but not on education in emergencies specifically. Um, data sharing between agencies should become the norm. So we recognize this is more of a collective action issue and that no individual organization is really incentivized to share their data with other agencies. But as a sector, it would benefit everyone if, if agencies um, did share their data better. Um, capacity building and preparedness um, was a particular issue. Um, and this links closely to EMIS systems, um, as well as uh, individual organizations that do programming. Um, and then the need to disaggregate and include invisible groups uh, in data. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So what progress have we made uh, since then? Um, so the action agenda really set out um, a plan to address some of these uh, key issues. And I'm gonna talk through progress we made against uh, some of these agreed actions at the summit. Um, and the first was that the INEE Data and Evidence Collaborative would convene um, an INEE reference group on EIE data. So this would be a, a new group uh, comprised of EIE data experts at uh, key organizations um, around the world to, to try and uh, take forward some of these key issues um, specifically. Um, and we're on the cusp of uh, establishing that. So we've done pretty wide consultation and found there's you know, very broad support for the creation of this group. Um, there is risk of uh, duplicating other initiatives, but with the right membership, um, we can make sure that doesn't happen and we just build on each other's work. Um, and we're currently speaking uh, with a couple of organizations who expressed interest in leading the group. Um, so hopefully keep an eye out for that and we'll have some announcements on the establishment of that group shortly. Um, the Data and Evidence Collaborative is also commissioning um, an ethics brief to look at, uh, as I mentioned, uh, ethical guidance on collection, storage, sharing and use of education emergencies data. So that's um, in the works and I think we have a planned publication date in October. So keep an eye out for that. And also, you know, get in touch if, if you want to um, be involved or input on it. Um, the Education Cluster and Humanitarian Data Exchange um, agreed at the Data Summit that they would work on a data sharing partnership. Um, and we'll hear a bit from Javier in the next presentation on that. Um, individuals at the summit also said they would uh, do internal lobbying at their own organizations to focus on capacity building um, on you know, data literacy um, and data collection within organizations. So hopefully some of you at the summit are on this line. You can feed into the Q&A or the chat, sorry, um, on progress on this, but I, I don't know how you're all doing on that. Hopefully making progress. And finally, we agreed that there would be a coalition to focus specifically on collection of IDP education data. So this is education data for internally displaced persons. Um, I think because this wasn't assigned to any specific group, I'm not sure if there is a coalition that is um, working together collectively on this. Although there is a huge amount of interesting work being done by different organizations, you know, such as the Humanitarian Data Exchange and the IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. So there's, there's lots of fantastic work going on, but I'm not sure if there's a, a coalition. Perhaps someone could mention that in the chat if there is. Next slide. Uh, okay, so I mentioned before that uh, we're creating a, an indicator framework for the minimum standards. Um, and this is under the INEE Standards and Practice Working Group. Um, and this came out of the a recognition that um, many organizations say that they um, work to or align with the INAE minimum standards, um, but there currently isn't a way to measure the extent to which organizations do this. And also other humanitarian standards, you know, the SPHERE standards, do have associated indicators. Um, so we identified a need to create an indicator framework. Um, so this framework is uh, is designed for use by uh, primarily programming staff, um, you know, for issues of monitoring and evaluation, but is open for, you know, anyone who, who wants to use it. 
Um, where we're at now is uh, we have a fairly final uh, list of about 50 indicators against the standards. Um, and where we could, we drew on um, already existing um, indicators from other indicator banks because we didn't want to just create new indicators and duplicate work. So they draw on existing indicators where we can. Um, we've consulted pretty widely um, on those and I think, yeah, we got some great feedback from a range of, of partners. And what we're doing now is we're trying to identify um, specific tools for each indicator so that you have guidance on how to, to measure the indicator. Um, of course, I think there's about 50 indicators, so no, no organization would be um, advised to try and um, report on all of them. It'd be up to them how to, or to select which ones are most uh, relevant um, to, their, to their needs. Um, and also to contextualize them to their context um, as people do with the minimum standards themselves. Um, and then, yeah, once we're happy with the tools, um, we're looking at piloting with um, a couple organizations um, to see really how it works. And again, yeah, if, if you would like to be involved in the piloting, uh, do reach out as well. Um, I think I just saw in the chat, uh, somebody asking when these will be uh, publish. Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, yeah, let me think on that and see if I can come up with a better response. Okay, uh, next slide. Yes, um, so as you may or may not know, the INEE um, hosts various collections of uh, resources um, on, on topics of relevance to education emergencies, and they're fantastic to, to check them out. Um, what we're um, collecting and, and putting together currently is um, a list of uh, resources of data and evidence relevant to COVID-19 and education. Um, the data sources fit into um, three categories. Um, these are sort of global repositories of data firstly on the impact of COVID-19 on education. So that's things like um, school closures. Um, second is um, pre-COVID-19 data that uh, shows students' access to uh, technology at home. Um, so this is useful to know, you know, whether students can participate in um, remote learning opportunities that are being offered by governments or, or um, non-governmental organizations. Um, so that's things like um, household surveys, such as the demographic health surveys, and the multiple hill indicator cluster surveys, um, as well as PISA and TIMS, you know, they all collect really rich um, background data on students, um, not just on technology, also on, you know, parental support for um, uh, education, you know, how good they are at self-study, that, that kind of thing and motivation. Um, third is a uh, repository on WASH data in schools, which I think is important to capture. Um, and aside from data, we also have collected uh, evidence sources. Um, the focus of these is um, global literature reviews on education and previous pandemics um, being particularly relevant um, to this one. Um, there's, a, there's a link at the top. It's not live yet, but will be in the next couple of days. And um, we'll announce that through a blog, so I'm, I'm sure you'll see that. But feel free to save the link if you'd like. Uh, if you do uh, manage any data sources or evidence sources that you think could be of relevance to this, then feel free to send those my way and my, my email um, is at the bottom there. Okay, next slide. Oh yes, uh, and if you want to stay up to date with all of this, um, INEE is hosting a new quarterly education emergencies data and evidence newsletter. Um, I think this previously existed with uh, the MIRS project, but it's being migrated to INEE. So if you'd like to receive this to stay up to date with all of these various things and up to date on new um, uh, pieces of data and evidence in education emergencies, then follow the steps there. So you visit the INEE website, you create and update your INEE profile and then subscribe to the, to the newsletter. So yeah, in, in summary, I think, yeah, there's lots of pieces in the air. We've made some uh, I think we've made some solid progress on the identified actions in uh, the action agenda for the EIE data summit. I think where we've made less progress uh, are those ones where we didn't sort of identify um, key individuals or organizations 
I had to take it forward, but you know, despite that, we're still making progress on, on all fronts. So yeah, looking forward to hearing your questions and hearing from the other presenters. Thank you, Sebastian. Great to hear about all this progress and also good to note where we still have some work to do. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to our second presenter, Javier Terran. Wanna go ahead, Javier? Thank you, Annie. I hope you can hear me hear me well and 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 hi everyone. Thank you for for the invitation. I'm very happy to to share a few words here with with all of you. So um, I will be talking about how the Center for Humanitarian Data is working towards increasing the use and impact of education data, all kind all types of education data in humanitarian response. Uh, in my next slide. So uh, with the support of the Education About all foundation, we spent 2018 and 2019 revamping our education data resources on XDX. So in case you don't know, XDX stands by the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is UN OHA's platform for data sharing. Uh, we started in 2014, in July 2014, with the goal of making it easier to not only to find, but also to share and use humanitarian data. Um, just for you to know, uh, humanitarian data, we define humanitarian data in the context of uh, all, all data about uh, the context in uh, humanitarian crisis is, is happening, but also uh, for us humanitarian data is all the data about the people affected, affect, affected by the crisis and their needs, and also data about the response by organizations and people seeking to help those who need assistance. So all these different types of data sets are part of what it, what it is XDX. Today we have about 20,000 data sets from approximately 275 organizations working in every single country in the world. Um, I was just checking before joining this session about our uh, usage statistics and we have uh, approximately uh, 80,000 unique users visiting XDX looking for data uh, and, and trying to uh, to find information that they can use for their analysis. And also uh, 12,000 of those 80,000 unique visitors are downloading a data set. Somehow that gave us a good um, sense of we are providing the data that, that may be needed for our community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see in this uh, small video, we have created a new education data page on XDX, which you can easily access by going to our website, which is data.comdata.org, and clicking on the quick links bar, which is on the top right corner. Uh, quick links is just a shortcut, an easy way to find um, uh, data on XDX, or you can find uh, the page that I'm referring to, the Education and Emergencies page, but also a uh, uh, feature crisis. So, so for instance, you can find uh, all data related to the pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis that we are living in now. So at the moment we have uh, more than 75 data sets related to the pandemic. Um, everything from cases and deaths from the WHO, but also uh, data from the WFP about uh, food prices, or transportation limitations or tra travel restrictions, and also impact of, of COVID-19 in education. A lot of data also coming from UNESCO on that regard. So um, if, you has, if you haven't visited our crisis page, I really invite you to, to go and, and, and surf that page may be some important information uh, for you. But going back to the education and emergencies uh, page that we have created, um, we offer a map where you can just go and click uh, on a country of your interest and you will see uh, the data on education that we have that has been classified in one of three major groups. So we have data about education facilities where you can basically find the location, the distribution, the capacity of different education facilities uh, at the country level. Uh, then you have data about the education statistics. In that sector, we basically put baseline information about education, so literacy rates, mostly coming from the World Bank and, and UNESCO, uh, enrollment rates, expenditure in education, funding as well, school resources, and also we have teaching conditions. So there is, uh, there is um, um, a good uh, set of 
interesting data set that, that you can find there. And then finally, the, the other category that we have included is um, uh, crisis data or, or education in emergencies data. So we have a lot of uh, data about incidents of education. We have also um, a typical OCHA product that is the 3 w the who is doing what, where. So um, all these type of data sets are easily easily found going to our uh, quick link education in emergencies uh, page. Um, uh, all these data, of course, couldn't be uh, possible to put all together without the, the support of the organizations uh, in this uh, seminar and also all the participants at that at the year ago seminar that we have in Geneva. And also, uh, we tried to maintain this data set as fresh as possible. So this page doesn't become a, a graveyard of data. So we try to, to keep it always fresh, always with a good um, component of metadata that can help analysts and people that use these data sets to make the most of this information. So um, this is um, another way that you can that you can see on this on this short video is that if you go to our data grid component, there is a section related to education where you can also find all the data related to education that that we have. And I think um, maybe the gift is a little bit. Uh, too fast, but there is a data set that I'm uh, showing here that's coming from Security Insights, which is one of our um, great partners on education, where you can see not only the, the data set availability, but also something that we call internally quick charts. Quick chart is just a way to see in, in, in less than two seconds what, a bit of insights of the data set, what, what kind of data you expect uh, coming from that data set without the need of uh, downloading the data set or putting it in, a, in Excel or, or try to manipulate it. So as, as soon as you click on that data set, you get a preview of what is in, inside. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so we're also working to, to identify new sources of education. And, um, and in this slide, you can see um, the, the effort that we have done together with the Qatar Computing Research Institute to identify tweets about education insecurity. So this visual shows um, attacks on education, on one hand coming from ACLED, that uh, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with this organization, ACLED stands by the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, but also with media discussions on Twitter. Uh, that, that had been classified by the Qatar Computer Research Institute using their, their uh, tool that is called um, ADAR, Digital Response Platform. So basically what we have done is combine uh, ACLED data with tweeted information to give um, an idea of potential uh, hotspots and flare-ups of attacks on education. So um, just for you to have an idea of the magnitude of the information that comes in this visualization, I think there are a little bit less than that 8 million tweets classified on this, on this visualization that before we couldn't be able to, to do it using uh, regular technology. But now with the development of technologies, we are able to train a machine that can understand and classify the different tweets and combine it with the, the, the regular uh, sources of info, info information. Uh, there's still some work to do on this data visualization. I think that the latest uh, accuracy report that, that I got from, from my colleagues is that uh, there is a 75%, 75-80 precision um, uh, percentage of, of this visualization. Uh, so there's still room to, for improvement. But you can see there is a lot, a lot that this, this can be uh, useful for our policy makers. So um, I don't know, I think Obada and David, uh, colleagues of mine are, are in, the, in the room. So they have been working very hard to, to train the machine. I think Obada spent quite some time looking at a little more than 12,000 tweets to, uh, to train the, the machine learning algorithm. So, so the Twitter machine can understand what are those tweets who can be relevant for, um, for this exercise. 
Uh, next slide, please. So what have we learned so far? So, well, there is a, a, a good opportunity to be working with all of you, with all the organizations around, around this, this, this forum to, uh, to support them in the data cleaning uh, activities and standardization. Uh, we love data. I mean, we are statisticians and, and data scientists that we, we like to get into, into data and try to maximize the information that is being collected. So we have been working hand in hand with many organizations and I'm very happy to continue doing that. Um, also, we have exposed in a lot the power, the power of data visualization. So uh, there are many data sets, huge data sets with a lot of columns and rows that if you spend a little of time developing a data visualization that helps a lot to the non-data savvy people. So we have been doing that with many partners and we, we, we love to continue doing that. Also data responsibility is a, an, an extremely important element on the work that we, that we have been doing. There is not a single data set that goes into XDX without being uh, checked for quality and, and for consistency and also for for sensitivity on XDX. So we check that there is no PII information or sensitive information that can lead to put a group or a person on, on risk. So there is always a QA that the, the team in XDX is conducting every time uh, you upload a data set on XDX. Um, we tag every data set as, 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 as careful as possible so we can increase the discoverability of those data sets wherever our users come to XDX. And also with the use of the humanitarian exchange language, we are increasing the interoperability of the data sets. You, you cannot imagine how much um, a data set, once it's standardized, can give so many potentials when it's combined with other data, data sources. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. It's not coming on my end, but I hope it's coming on your end. There you go. We can see it. Thank I you. can see the slide that says next steps. Perfect. So one less. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So what do we want to do in the in the weeks and months to come? Um, well, we want to keep working with you. We want to show you the benefits of sharing data. Um, Sebastian already touched on that. There is a big need to, to share all the data that is being collected and, and produced. Uh, great if it's on XDX, but if not, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the goal that we, you are, we are pursuing is to expose the data. All the effort that is being done on collecting data should benefit a lot of uh, uh, everybody. So we want to support you on that. We want to keep working with the global education cluster so we can simplify the, uh, the different bits and pieces of education data that are being collected and also make that data available to everyone, of course, in a responsible, responsible way. Um, we want to also um, uh, work with you to, to use um, standards, data standards, in particular, the humanitarian exchange language would be a very easy, long hanging fruit standard that we invite you to use and to put on your data sets. And also we want to uh, support you to, to increase uh, your understanding and capab capabilities to access and use data. In other words, we want to work with you on data literacy. Our sector needs a lot of uh, help on, on that. I mean, there's a lot of data there that is just a matter of pushing just a little bit to expose a lot of, of insights and findings. So data literacy, I really, really would like to, to work with all of you. And the center is working very hard to develop uh, modules that can help our community to be better on, on data. So I think, um, I, can, I think I'm one more slide. Next slide, please. Okay. We see your thank you slide, yeah. You. And, and, my, uh, and the site of the center in case um, you want to, to learn more of the work that we do. Thank you. And,
Thank you so much. And um, I just want to say that, you know, it was really exciting to see those visualizations and see those um, animations that you had in your presentation and see all the work that's been done. And your team has really just been such a great partner to INEE um, as we think through some of these issues. So we're excited to continue to work, con continue to work with you on some of these low hanging fruits and next steps. Um, okay, so we're going to turn to our next presentation. Um, Benoit Dansenberg from UNHCR, handing it over. Thank you and thank you all. I hope you can hear me well. Um, good morning, good afternoon. I hope you're well wherever you are. Um, the Safe Collection Storage Sharing and Analysis and Use of Correct and Relevant Data on Children and Their Families is obviously essential to all aspects of UNHCR's work. UNHCR has signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, UNES the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. And the findings that are uh, presented today are part of this joint work. Uh, in September 2019, we launched the new strategy for refugee uh, education. It's called a strategy for refugee inclusion, inclusion into national education systems in line with the global compact on refugees. Next, please. This strategy has some targets that you can find here. One uh, target for uh, pre-primary, another one for primary, secondary, and then one for tertiary. Obviously, we would like to be able to measure progress towards those targets. And I think we need to acknowledge that at this stage, we are not in a position in all countries to do so. Um, so this is precisely why uh, we want to work with a number of partners to strengthen our data management system. Next, please. So what are the, the sources we use to collect data on refugee uh, education? The first one is certainly EMIS and in line with the refugee inclusion into national education systems. We would like refugee education data to be captured uh, by EMIS. But I think it's important to realize that at this stage, a number of schools uh, that refugees attend are not included into existing EMIS. And also it is important that a number of EMIS does do not uh, disaggregate uh, according to refugee status. So it's very hard to know. We know that refugees are included, but we don't know how many. So this is something we want to work on as well. School administrative, administrative data are used in a context where the schools are not included in EMIS or in countries where EMIS does uh, not function. The third source of information is UNHCR's registration data. Uh, this is the system that is used when refugees arrive in a new country, in a host country. They are registered. There are no um, mandatory education question. And um, there is a, a module that is dedicated to education data, but uh, at the moment it's not very much used. So we have to wait for registration updates when the data are verified. There, there is more time to actually try to capture some data on education. Then a fourth uh, source of data is household surveys. Uh, this is uh, an, an important uh, approach that I'm sure you're very familiar with. 
it's important to capture out of school uh, children uh, where the um, MIS is, um, where this information is not captured in MIS. Um, one example of this is the, the mix, the multiple indicator cluster surveys led by, by UNICEF. Uh, we certainly want to um, co cooperate with, with mix. Um, the challenge there is that the migration status is not always captured. And again, we don't know if refugees have been included or not. Another example of household uh, surveys is the UNHCR socio-economic assessments that a number of countries are undertaking. And uh, we are in the process of including an education module into those um, assessments. The fifth source of data is uh, on the, the learning assessments. Uh, obviously, we want to go beyond access. We want to know how refugees are learning. Uh, this, is, this is challenging and it's obviously linked to the lack of data on access because to you know, assess learning, uh, you need to know where the students are in school. Um, so this is... Um, yeah, I, I think for learning assessments, our key ask is for refugees to be included uh, so that so that we we can uh, finally know how they are doing at school. Uh, next slide, please. Here um, on the availability of data, I think you will you will all agree that it's easier. Uh, to collect data in a refugee camp or settlement versus urban populations, uh, for example. And uh, even if uh, camps is not the preferred option from the education point of view, it's easier to capture uh, data. A key challenge we face that I've already mentioned is the um, the uh, inclusion, the, the 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 lack of refugee status disaggregation in countries where we have inclusion into national education systems. Again, this is the preferred approach, but it should come also with some kind of disaggregation, so that we know how many refugees have actually access to education. Disaggregation by sex, age, disability, and language is essential. Uh, just let me just uh, mention age. Age is very important. A large uh, proportion of our refugee populations, we have many over age children in school. It's important we capture age. And language, language can uh, very, in many cases be an obstacle to access to education. So language is important as well. And uh, disaggregation by nationality instead of refugee status can be a good proxy in a number of our operations. Next, please. Um, Protection in Information Management, or PIM, perhaps a, a new acronym to your collection. This is, uh, this is essential. This is at the core of UNHCR's mandate, which is protection. And it's basically putting in place the right measures um, so that we address sensitivities around uh, individual um, refugee data. And um, as you can see, this is guided by a number of principles. And I will just mention two. Um, the first one is to be guided by the interest, well-being and rights of the affected population and their host. And the second one calls, in fact, for a risk assessment 
to make sure that the collection of data is not uh, putting refugees in danger. Let's, net, let's not forgetting that refugees have actually fled their countries for good security reasons. So this protection um, aspect is important. It's adding to the complexity of uh, refugee education data uh, collection, but it's, it's something that we need to, to take into account. Next, please. Just a point on the indicators we're using. If you go to this website that is indicated there, you will find our the, a site which is called Global Focus, which is the place where all um, UNHCR country operations are actually reporting. Um, the, I, I must admit once again that at this stage, the reporting on those indicators is still very patchy. Uh, so this is something we are working on with the various country operations. Next. This is a relatively new uh, indicator that is linked to the Global Compact on Refugees, in the, included in the, in the indicator framework. And the idea here is to, to see how far we go in terms of uh, inclusion into national education systems. Next, please. So on the way forward, uh, we are working with a number of partners. I mentioned uh, the UIS, um, but we are working also with UNICEF and, and other partners on strengthening refugee ed education data management systems. Um, we are, to do so, we, are, we want to gradually increase the refugee education data coverage in the countries we work with. It's not like we don't have data at all. Obviously, some countries are collecting good data, but we would like to have this across the board. Um, I mentioned the importance of protection, and here we need to find a good combination between the obvious need for data with the protection concerns that I raised earlier. Then one point on COVID-19, we obviously need data to monitor the return to school. I think we are very concerned about the risk of dropout, particularly for girls. Uh, so we need to be in a position to compare the pre-COVID-19 and the post-COVID-19 data to ensure that those who were in school have access and can actually resume their education and hopefully hoping that more will be able to, to join. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benoit. Um, it's really interesting to see how UNHCR has been grappling with these issues and challenges. Um, and I know that uh, some of these came up in the, um, the data summit last summer, and some of them are in, you know, lots of progress has been made since that time, and there's some even new issues arising. So thank you so much for that update. Um, we're going to go to our next presenter, our last presenter for today in terms of um, actual presentations before we go on to our discussion. So our fourth presenter is Alice Castillejo from Translators Without Borders. Handing it over to you, Alice. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it was lovely to hear Benoit talking about the need for language disaggregated data because I think that's largely what I'm gonna be focusing on today. But I'm going to draw from a bit from our research uh, that has come from various humanitarian responses, um, particularly around how that data can make a difference and what not collecting it can do. Uh, next slide, please. So I've started with an example about why data matters. Translators Without Borders carried out some research in March of last year with the Rohingya community, both in Cox's Bazaar and in Sitwe. And the, in our research, we examined what the difference was between what humanitarian workers understood of, of the language needs of that community 
And to do so, we, we interviewed and dis had discussions with more than 100 humanitarian staff, both local and international. And the majority believed that they could communicate with the Rohingya community using spoken Burmese, Rakhine or Chittagonian dialect. And most believed that Rohingya community were literate in Burmese. Next slide, please. The reality of the communication from the Rohingya perspective, based on self-reporting and focus groups and interviews and comprehension testing, showed a very, very different picture. Later on in the presentation, I'm going to look a little bit about what the impact of this lack of awareness was on planning, on teacher support and community engagement, amongst other things. We would like to think that the humanitarian's lack of knowledge about the languages spoken and written by the, human, the Rohingya community are an exception, but actually our evidence from other emergencies, Northeast Nigeria, Mozambique, the Ebola response in DRC, shows us really clearly that a lack of language data is a huge problem affecting humanitarian program across contexts and honestly across sectors. Education is not unique. So next slide, please. Um, so understanding what we need to change, it's just a little bit important to understand first what it is we're failing to do. So I'm going to break this down. The first one is that we really don't know what languages are spoken and by whom. And that sort of underpins many of, these, many of the other issues. There's then a lack of awareness about the impact of language on all other kinds of data collection. There's an over-dependence on unsupported uh, no local and national staff and national partners. And I'm going to explain that later on in, some, in looking at the Bangladesh and Myanmar situation. And fundamentally, a failure to disaggregate educational indicators by language, which is, um, makes, makes understanding it further more complex. Next slide, please. So we desperately lack language data across the whole humanitarian spectrum. At best, there is some language information from censuses. It's often out of date. It almost always doesn't take account of population movement or of literacy. And really crucially, the information on the extent to which ma marginalized language speakers might understand the majority language is always unavailable. And it's something which in each context needs further research. Humanitarian and development actors don't routinely collect information about languages of people they're working with. So when we do assessments and we're recording gender and age and household size, we don't routinely ask about languages. The organizations that do collect it don't routinely share it. So we are now involved very heavily in, uh, heavily in mapping and sharing language data on our website and on the humanitarian data exchange site. And we have uh, multiple maps and data sets also linked to language and COVID. Please, please, uh, if this is interesting for you, take a look at some of those. Obviously, the COVID response has taken the challenge of existing multilingual responses to an even larger scale. But the issues of language data to plan the response remain the same. And if anything, they're more pronounced as the flexibility for face-to-face -face communication and interpretation is reduced. Um, one of the issues that this comes back to is that by and large organizations have relied so heavily on their local staff to fill the edge, to fill the data gap for them, to tell them what languages are spoken by whom. But this has always been a flawed approach. Locally engaged staff and local partner organizations, by and large, tend to come from majority language groups. After all, international organizations mostly recruit, recruit those staff based on whether they're able to speak the language the international organization speak, speaks. And without data about the local languages anyway, it would be very difficult to have a communication strategy which allows you to recruit to meet that, to, to, to meet the language needs. So this leads in general to an over-dependence on majority and official languages and under, underestimates the comprehension difficulties of those. In the assessments and the program design and the new ways of working with the COVID response, we do have an opportunity um, to collect and use language data differently. It, in the marginalized languages, if we don't collect that data and if we don't make an effort to do this more effectively, marginalized languages, the speakers will remain, will be left further behind. Next slide, please. So data collection needs to be done in the language of the speakers that the data is being, uh, being asked from. And this has always been a challenge in the past and it has become even more challenging in COVID, COVID times. So we know from our previous research, our findings in Nigeria, that enumerators have struggled with the concepts and term, terms in surveys. Surveys are, are typically written in English, 
the reply and the reply the, the enumerator does a uh, an instant uh, interpretation and translation into the local languages for the community and then translates it back again. But what our research has showed us is the enumerators, when they were asked, to, when we tested them on the key terms in their surveys, understood at best 80% of the terms in their surveys and at worst only 10% of the terms in the surveys they'd already carried out, meaning that the, the, the ability to make translation was going to be very limited. Now, during this period in which COVID is affecting how, we, how we're able to communicate with, pe with people, the data being gathered remotely is going to be even more difficult to get from marginalised language speakers. We recognise that people from vulnerable language groups who speak marginalised languages are less likely to have access to technology. We sometimes forget that maybe that, that, that probably means they can't use any auto translate functions, something like Google Translate, for example, from any other language to their own. And of course, they may not even have a written script. Where we do produce materials in their language, and we're seeing quite encouragingly organizations really making an effort to try and get material and gather data in the right language, it can be quite easy for people working on those technological solutions to forget even some of the small things that drop down menus need to be in the right language, function buttons need to be in the right language. Um, and, and these can be real challenges, I think, as people try and move uh, to adjust uh, to COVID approaches. But obviously not only our outward information, but also the two-way communication, which allows people to give feedback, report abuses, express concerns, all of these need to be functional in the languages that people speak. Next slide, please. The next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we found uh, through the, the research in Myanmar and in Cox's Bazaar, and a little bit more about what the impact was for the, of the inattention to language. Um, from our research back in, 2000, in July 2019. As you'll remember from the start of the slideshow, we saw that there was a very poor understanding from the humanitarian response about what the, the need, language needs were of the Rohingya community. And we'll now look at what that meant. Next slide, please. So in terms of teachers, in Cox's Bazaar, what we found was that teachers were really struggling to absorb and to use very unfamiliar participatory education techniques. And that was partly because the cascade training had failed to convey key terms into the language that they understood. The cascade training had gone through three different languages in its rollout and ultimately was not, bit, not often being delivered in Rohingya, which was the teacher's mother tongue. I have to say we see quite of, often this issue of trying to convey complex, uh, quite sophisticated uh, ideas about teacher education and pedagogy being explained in, in very, using language which is very unfamiliar for teachers. So in addition to that, teachers professional assessment, which is quite often now being, being developed as an online methodology, was in that case of the Rohingya community being judged in a multiple choice test using English and Myanmar languages, two languages which the teachers were not familiar with. So if communication with teachers over, for example, COVID distance learning or return to school plans is all being done using official languages only, we, what we may find is that teachers are not able to, to understand it fully. Um, at the moment, TWB, we're working with the Global Education Cluster on trying to help them understand what is accessible material for national staff uh, at, at, across, across the education sector and including teachers. And we hope to have some findings soon on, soon on how well teachers understood materials in official language and in their, in their mother tongue. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, children in the Rohingya context were being graded based on an ACER test, which was being delivered in Myanmar and English, two languages which the children spoke very little. They felt hugely frustrated that their previous years of education had meant uh, fairly little in terms of placing them in appropriate classes, simply because they didn't understand the assessment languages. Um, the move to lots of different distance learning formats during COVID, we'll, we know will have removed uh, the an important element of translanguaging that teachers often can offer in classrooms and this may well leave lots of minority students far less able to benefit from the distance learning materials. Next slide please. When we looked at how the kind of language issues had affected parents there was, there was a sense in which parents just couldn't uh, understand what the humanitarian sector was trying to offer in terms of education. They were struggling to understand some of the concepts. 
and they felt that the humanitarian education hadn't taken them seriously. But this was in part, from the findings from our research, was in part because the conversations that were being had around education and why education looked different now for them than it had done previously in, in Myanmar, was that a lot of those conversations were being held in Chittagonian, which is a language which is very difficult for the, for the parents to understand in. Um, we know that during this period of distance programming for COVID, many parents are going to need additional information in their language, regardless of the language of instruction for children. Um, some of this might be very simple. For example, the, the correct time and day uh, to turn on the radio so that children can listen to educational radio programming or some additional material to help parents support children carrying out an educational task or about returning to school. So lots of these conversations are crucially to need to be held, or so lots of this information and conversations need to be held in languages that parents understand, which and the only way to do that is to have the data around what community languages are out there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and finally, returning, I suppose, to the original theme, if we look at EIE data and many of the MS systems more widely, primary language is very rarely gathered at enrolment or tracked through the education systems. So as examples, education partners might know that there's, let's say, a 75% uh, enrolment in their area, but they might not be able to see that the 25% not attending schools are from a, a from predominantly from one language group. And they, therefore, they won't be able to unpick the reasons why that is the case to understand whether it's because education didn't meet their needs in the way that it was being organized, or they simply didn't understand the, the enrollment processes. They also cannot track language as a factor for early dropout or failure, failure to progress. So if this issue is disproportionately affecting one language group, they can't address their, address their programming to try, and, uh, to try and meet that need. So both in the short term in our COVID responses and in the long term for educational planning and management, we must begin tracking student engagement and progress using language as a vulnerability indicator. And if we don't, we may never understand how important it is. Next slide, please. So here are a few things that we think would be useful to, uh, to, to enable us to improve. Obviously, we need to make sure that language on, that, sorry, that data on languages, the language spoken in the areas that we all work in, is available. So now, as I mentioned previously, we're now producing interactive maps and detailed data sets to help responders understand the languages of the response in the countries where we're working, and we've mapped these against uh, COVID data and made that available. We need to make sure that assessments gather data from people in the language they speak. Um, and we need to make sure that we support enumerators if we're going to be using them to be confident in all the terms that they're using. And to make sure that online systems are also appropriately targeted to the minority languages if we're expecting them to be used online. As we move to remote systems of communication, the need to gather data and feedback in minority languages must not be forgotten. And increasingly, we're working on kind of technological solutions to try and ena enable that process. Once we have the language data, we need to use it, obviously, in, to make programming language sensitive by working with teachers and communities in children to, in the languages that they understand to get the deepest possible engagement. Designing learning materials and, assess and assessments in particular in such a way that minority speakers are not disadvantaged and that they can demonstrate their competence and that we can gather accurate data about their learning for, to inform future programming and ultimately to track children's, children's enrollment, progress, retention, and to get their feedback is, is absolutely crucial, critical, and to be able to disaggregate that by language is essential. We're never gonna know to what extent language affects education until we all routinely start disaggregating against language in our data sets. And perhaps, even though it's difficult, some of the new approaches being developed through in the COVID, in the COVID uh, period might allow us to do this in ways that we have never done before. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Alice. And what I love about your presentation is that it really brings us back to the real life implications of our data systems and the implications of not collecting data on language consistently um, and according to the um, recommendations that you laid out for us. So thank you so much for that. This has been a great set of presentations. Um, I'm going to pass the baton now to our distinguished discussant, Dr. Moira Fall, who will provide some remarks about the presentations and also moderate the Q&A for us. Over to you, Moira. 
Thank you very much, Annie, and thank you so much for those absolutely fascinating presentations. Um, as Annie said, I'm here to provide some comments and also moderate the Q&A. So just to point you in the direction of the Q&A, on your screen, top or bottom or middle, depending on what you're using, there's a little box that says Q&A, please. Could you write your questions in that box and then we can make sure that we are taking those questions. If there's a question that you know is directed to one particular panelist, please do write their name. It gives us a, an idea of how and uh, to whom we should be addressing the questions. Um, and the evidence shows that the best way to get the best questions from an audience is to give them some time between the presentations and actually uh, sending the questions along. So um, the most important thing that's going to happen in the next five minutes is you're going to be crafting some great questions um, while I speak and say something about some of the presentations that we've just um, been had the pleasure to listen to. Now, the main issue at the operational level remains obviously the diversity and the changing nature of the crisis situations in which we are attempting to collect these data and evidence. And that really requires those flexible systems and new modes of collaboration, and crucially, making sure that we acknowledge the non-neutrality of data and data collection, and how we're building the capacity of all actors to be involved. And certainly, our work at NORAG uh, the heart of our work at NORAG on education and emergencies is um, Patrick Monduides that Annie mentioned right at the beginning of uh, this uh, seminar. And so um, in terms of the INEE group, that presentation, um, the question that I had um, arising from the presentation and also from the Global Data Summit that we had the pleasure of co-hosting um, in Geneva with the support of um, USAID and the Swiss Development uh, Cooperation, SDC as well, is um, how is it that we can um, help in terms of making that group um, fully participatory? And when I say we, I mean all of us, this is not just uh, NORAG. So, you know, in terms of questions of who can afford to contribute, who can afford to come to the meetings, who doesn't have the visa issues, um, how do we involve member state statisticians as well as civil society? And really sort of surfacing and amplifying those voices alongside um, the usual suspects, maybe would be one way of uh, phrasing it. And with these webinars, uh, these virtual CIES, that means that, you know, we can overcome these issues and COVID has certainly shown us um, that there are um, uh, accessibility issues and participation that can be overcome to a certain extent using different technologies. And um, at the end of 2019, there was a wildly successful virtual meeting um, that INEE held as well. So this is, is this a, a model that we can use to, to bring these things um, forward for more people? Um, in, for the um, OCHA, this, I mean, this, uh, this data website is a, it's a superb technical feat. And I just wanted to maybe give you the opportunity to address some of the issues and um, questions that came up in the UNHCR presentation around the, the data for what, who, who are you serving, how you're serving them, and the, as you said yourself, having standardized or harmonized versions of these data and data sets is, is absolutely critical. And um, the methods that you're using to make sure that these, uh, these data are um, available quickly, they're accessible and standardized, um, is very important and that specificity to education and to the audience and those who, who need to have these data and, and, and can use them. The, uh, in the UNHCR presentation, as Annie said, huge progress, um, progress from both the standard indicators and also focus. Um, I suppose a question coming up from that is how 
to reconcile the refugee and the population data. And I know UNHCR is very careful with, um, with data around data questions. Um, the question is if we have this EMIS system working with uh, national systems, how do we make sure that um, the, the data on vulnerable populations is, is really kept, kept safe and so that those people are kept safe. And um, Alice's presentation from Translators Without Borders was very interesting in, in, in really showing us how language makes the issue of, of exclusion and inclusion audible as well as visible. And this is a really important uh, topic that's taken up in, in several pieces in the NORAC special issue that we, that we did on um, data and evidence. And I'm going to send a link to that in the chat. Um, if you don't find, if you don't see the link, then if you just search for NORAG special issue um, data um, and emergencies, you'll be able to find it. And my last sentence, just to give you the chance to add some more questions to the Q&A box, um, is really that, um, as Patrick has said to us many times before in, in NORAG, the, the scarcity of education data in crisis settings is important, but we really do have growing evidence that this community has been able to develop data collection processes and that these data collection processes are and can be fit for purpose, they can be safe and they can be effective and they can critically be sensitive to all of these inclusion issues that are even more complex when we have complex situations in which we're intervening. And absolutely critically, that these processes are leading to action on the ground. So thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to INE for organizing this. And um, I will now take a look in the Q&A box. And uh, we have two questions there that we'll take straight away while the rest of you have the chance to um, write something else in. Oh, while I'm here, when you're looking in the Q&A, you can see that there are tabs that say open and answered. So do take a look also at the answered questions. Oh, three, great. Okay, so the first question we have here from Luke, um, maybe could be taken up by Benoit. Um, how have these systems and initiatives linked with uh, child protection? And then I'll just take another question as well and just uh, throw that to, let's see, is data collection considering all contexts of emergencies? And are there specific tools to collect data for different contexts? Maybe uh, the panelists could all um think about in their own context how they're actually collecting data and how they could answer that and then there's a question here specifically for you alex alice which is does translators without borders or others have any resources that can support organizations that would like to move towards greater language sensitivity in their data and work so should we start first with you benoit on the linking the systems with child protection please? Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it will answer your question, your point also okay. about, you know, it, it, this integration of refugee education data into national education systems. And there's clearly a tension between the two, between collection of data analysis, storage of data, communication of data, and protection. And um, this is an ongoing discussion. And obviously, we don't want to compromise protection. So I mentioned the assessment uh, that will have to be done in, in, in all situations where we have this inclusion into national education systems without refugee status disaggregation. And to be honest, at the moment, we are looking for a solution. And uh, that involves different parts of UNHCR, not least our 
protection colleagues. And as I said in the presentation, we need to combine the two and try to reconcile uh, the two concerns. The concern for the need for data, we realize this is crucial for advocacy planning purposes, but also our protection mandate. So this is ongoing, the discussion is ongoing, and I look forward to brief you once we've agreed on practical steps to take this forward. Thank you. Fabulous. We look forward to hearing from you, Benoit. Thank you. Alice, would you like to take the next question on uh, the resources to support organizations to do better? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we, the answer, uh, of course, is yes, we, we do work very hard to try and give people resources that are available. Um, we some of it is uh, sort of openly available work, which we do, for example, as I was mentioning, the maps so that organizations are, are able to take much more informed decisions about what languages they're going to work into. Um, and we can, we're very happy to discuss with organizations maybe making choices about the, la the sizes of the language groups that they've got or what we refer to as pivot languages, you know, languages from which they can reach other more, more minor languages. So we do lots of work on that area. Um, we also do a lot of work around plain language. The very first part of good communication is to be able to write simply and clearly in the first place. And that can get you a very long way before you, do, before you need to add, uh, add other languages. It can also make sure that it can also make you reach a lot more people uh, without necessarily having to translate. And it can also make sure that it, it can also aid enormously in getting your translations better. So we do a lot of work on that. And then we do a lot of work and you'll find it all on our, on our website around open source terminology resources trying to help trying to help organizations have multilingual glossaries that they can use uh, to talk around maybe emotional and psychological support issues around child protection and protection issues for example and those uh, allow people to look for the least stigmatizing or non-stigmatizing terms that are available available to discuss issues, for example, around well-being with children. So those, so there's lots of resources that are available online, and we we do lots of uh, kind of ad advice and support for partners. So please do feel free to get in touch. Fabulous, Alice. Thank you. So before we go to the general question on the specific tools. We have a question here on the HDX, which um, maybe you could take, Javier, which is um, HDX and others are great repositories for data, but is there possibly a potential danger of having too many actors focused on EIE data collection and systems? And so the issue that Fogel raises is, are we missing intersections for the added value of multi-sectoral multi approaches? Have thank you, you thank you for that uh, question. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, uh, I don't think so. I think um, at least from uh, speaking from the humanitarian data exchange side, there is um, something called APIs um, that allows different systems to be connected. So I don't think there is any duplication. Uh, now we live in an era where where technology is allowing us to connect different systems at the same time. And something that we do very strongly on XCX is that every data set that comes into the platform comes with a strong component of metadata. So metadata is, is data about the data that allows to say where the data is coming from, what is the methodology that was used to collect this information, what is the license, license under which this data can be, can be shared. So having those elements really improve the way our users are, are, are using the, the data sets. And um, also let me just clarify that XDX is, is, is a repository of different sources of, of data. We don't do data collection itself. We pull data from UNHCR, from IOM, from UNESCO, from IAP. EP from Security Insights. The idea is just to provide a, a, a one-stop shop where the users and the process can come and find the data. I don't think is there is any chances of duplication. On the contrary, I I, I believe it's more complementary uh, to have different platforms uh, uh, out there.
Okay, or, thank you very much. So there's um, there's clearly an, in Fergal's question around this issue of we need specialist data on education and yet obviously there are cross-cutting interlinkages across the other issues and sectors and how um, how we can address that. So maybe we could um, open up to all of the panelists to answer to, to answer that first question about the data collection tools. How do we have, what is it that um, you would uh, say is available in terms of data collection tools um, to be uh, with regards to this? Hi, I'll, I'll uh, jump in on a couple uh, things. Uh, so on, um, there, yeah, there was a question on uh, child protection um, and it's relevant to other sectors because, yeah, one of the things the Data Summit highlighted was how much education data is collected by other sectors such as health, WASH and child protection that we just don't know about or don't use in, in education. So yeah, there definitely is a need to, to work with other sectors better. Um, the INEE um, has established uh, an initiative with the Child Protection Alliance, you know, the equivalent of INEE in, in child protection, um, and that's being led by Mark Chappell. So you can reach out to him, um, and I'll, I'll send a link in the in the chat. Actually, let's just do that. But, uh, all panelists, yeah. So have have a look at that if you're interested in specific specifics of uh, working closer with the uh, child protection section, and you can reach out to Mark his emails. Um, there. Um, yeah, on, on context, yeah, we didn't redefine really uh, what context we're talking about. Um, but yes, definitely covering all types of emergencies, um, you know, ranging from uh, conflict to natural disasters to pandemics. Um, yeah, covering all of those. Um, we were asked um, how we can be more participatory, and uh, that's definitely something that is um, on. INEE's radar uh, broadly, thanks to you know um, a consultation they did towards the end of last year, I think, um, and uh, yeah, has been raised as something to address in the next iteration of their uh, working groups, which uh, come to a close later this year, I believe. Um, and you know, specifically for our work in the Data and Evidence Collaborative, you know, this is a group that's led by people based in North America and Europe, um, but in the creation of the um, reference group of experts that we're, that we're trying to set up. Um, uh, we very proactively tried to reach out and speak to uh, relevant ministries of education. We spoke to IGAD and we're very keen for them to all participate and uh, lead uh, the group when, when it does um, start. We don't want to create um, uh, a new group of just Northern based um, actors um, like myself. Um, what else? There's a question on IDPs. Uh, yeah, so that question on IDPs is yeah. the IDP Education Coalition. So if somebody's interested, where would they go to to be able to sign up to something that was working on IDPs okay. or? Yeah, so I think the people who are working most uh, on IDP education or the, yeah, the people most relevant to reach out to would be the International Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC. Uh, they have one person there, Crystal Kazabat, um, who attended the Data Summit, who, who works a lot on education, is doing really interesting work. Um, so as such, I don't believe there is a coalition uh, working specifically on IDP education, um, but the most natural leadership or host for that would be uh, IDMC. So I suggest uh, reaching out uh, to them on, on that. Great. And the other, and embedded in that question was also the, within education and emergencies, who are those the most pressing education issues? Uh, people with disabilities, invisible groups, IDPs, etc. So there's a question there on the, the most marginalised and the effects of um, emergencies on their education, um, which was also more uh, which was broader in terms of is there some kind of an inter intra agency coalition? 
any anybody know anything any of the panelists about those specific issues is it taken out it's disaggregated into data and evidence how do we have our data and evidence collection being sensitive to to the most disadvantaged who tend to be invisible even in not in emergencies or more invisible or not in emergencies uh, maybe I can speak to this very briefly. I mean, I, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a specific coalition arranged around this. Um, it would be very interesting if there would be, and uh, you know, we'd be delighted to be involved. But I think there has been some really good progress made in the sense that there has been new guidance issued around assessments, um, and this has been, uh, I think, done both from the from the global education uh, cluster and also reflected in also in IANEE guidance. In that, it's, uh, certainly in terms of edu of language there is specific guidance on on being inclusive of language in both in in both those sets of guidance around data gathering so that's been a really big step forward and we were looking forward to get it to for it to be used and to be able to see the results of it i think so far there's not yet been an assessment process which allows us to to look at what the results of that are great okay so obada diab who asked that question the the field is open for you to to start something on that and we look forward to seeing the progress on that. Um, we did have one other question from uh, Patrick Mondurides, which Javier answered already in the Q&A. Um, I'd just like to read it out for completeness. So uh, the question was around the degree of harmonization that exists between the sources. Can one compare participation, repetition, survival rates coming from all of the various sources? And um, so Javier's answer was to use the human exchange language to increase in the interoperability of the data. Um, it's not easy, but uh, metadata is the key element for the data sets on um, HDX. Right, we have answered all of the questions with two minutes to go. So I think we've done our, well, our job well, Annie. I'll hand back I to you now. I agree completely. I think we are ready to wrap up the webinar now. Um, thank you for such wonderful presentations and for the great discussant role that you played, Moira. Um, the recording of this webinar and all related presentations will be shared with all of the registrants by email and also posted on the INEE website. So you'll have access to all of this. Um, we hope to continue the discussion with all of you next Wednesday. I think I'm not mistaken in saying it's at the same time, so 10 a.m. Eastern, and that um, is going to look at the use of data. And then on, the, on July 2nd, I think at the same time also, 10 a.m. Eastern, I hope, uh, we will have the final presentation in this particular series uh, focused on um, basically strengthening education data systems in response to crisis, a little bit more focus on, on the EMIS side of things. Um, so thank you all so much for your participation today, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Annie.